if you're working at a W-2 job, your tax is already being taken out for what they call FICA and, and income tax, mm-hmm. right? There's two different categories. When that's happening for you, at the end of the day, the IRS is saying, well, you're getting automatic withholdings from your company. And if they're doing it correctly, at the end of the day, like you're gonna be owe a little bit more money, or you're gonna be in a refund position, or you're gonna be exactly correct, which rarely happens. When you're an entrepreneur, no one is taking out FICA tax for you, no one is taking out federal income tax for you, state income tax for you. So you're basically saying, I need to estimate for myself, for my business, what those taxes are gonna be based on the rates that's available uh, freely on, on IRS website, and say, I have made I have an incredible month. I made $300,000 this quarter. Let me say, let me put in like a good reserve of 20% that I need to pay to the IRS, right? And that's what you do. You take that money, go on the IRS website and say, here you go, hold this money for me, right? And every quarter, it's going to build up. So then at the end of the day, the IRS may be holding around $40,000 for you. I'm just throwing out a random number, right? And then you do your tax filing, you're like, and then all the calculation comes out, you're like, oh, I actually owe them $42,000. If that's the case, that means I already prepaid $40,000, so I only owe the government $2,000 more. That's it. Or it. opposite scenario, I prepaid $40,000, I did all my calculation, I, I was really smart, or I was working very smart CPA, and they got me my tax liability down to $32,000. Oh, wow, I'm getting an $8,000 refund. Hooray. Let me go start another business or you know, start another podcast or anything you like with the money. That's what the IRS expect you to do prepay the money just like if you would be working a W-2 job. So a lot of entrepreneurs out there don't know that. They think that just like the W-2 9 to 5 job, they pay at the end of April 15 deadline, they're good to go. But that's because when you have a W-2 job, you get a pay stub and taxes are automatically taken out from, from you. That's why you like sometimes you complain. It's like, ah, why do I get paid so little? Well, that's because taxes got taken out for you. Don't think that, you know, whatever number you see on Stripe or Shopify, it's like, oh, that's how much money I made. Let me go show off on some, on some form somewhere. Like, this is my screenshot, right? Take a little haircut from it, take a 20, 25% from that, right? Store it in a separate bank account, put it in a separate like savings account, like a high yield savings account. Put it there, don't move it, let it grow some interest over the year, and then make sure you have enough to you know, pay the money and hopefully your interest is higher than the penalty they pay you and use the interest to pay, pay the penalty. Many content creators are probably not thinking about investing and planning for the future in terms of their business or even just like personally retiring. And so what are some things that they can do within their business? How can they use their money? Maybe there's you know some leftover money after they've paid themselves, You know they have some leftover money and they've already invested back into their podcast or whatever they have. What do you work with your clients and see? There's a lot of options they can take, right? And it's really up to the objective of the business owner. Some business owners come to us and say, I want to get out of this business in 10 years. What can I do to to achieve that, right? Some are just like, I just want to make sure my kids are well taken care of, everything's going to be okay in the future. Or some are just saying, I just want to be as rich as possible. (laughs) How many lines of business can I be in and what can I do with with this money to make that happen in, in the short term? And depending on the answer they give me, I give them options. One is of course, there's a lot of retirement investment vehicles available. If you're just a single member LLC, which means you're the only owner of LLC, there's what they call solo 401k. So you may have heard of 401k if you ever work in a company. They give you around like mm-hmm. $21,000, $22,000 a year of contribution that you can make yep. towards a retirement account and they give you the benefit of uh, getting a tax deduction during the same year you put that money in. As a solo 401k, it, it has that an employee portion, contribution portion, which is the same as if you're a W-2 employee, but since you're also the owner of the business, you get what they call an employer contribution. So in total, you can get almost up to, it, the number keeps changing, I, I would say it's around $66,000 of contribution that you can put. So that's basically $66,000 of dollars that you can stash into your retirement account and also have that as a deduction the year you did that. So if you did it for your tax year 2023, that's $66,000 less of your taxable income that you're looking at. So that, that's a very powerful thing that I think a lot, a lot of business owners don't know and can take advantage of. And if your spouse works in your business, that number doubles. So okay. instead of 66,000, you're looking at about 132,000. Another yeah. thing, a lot of things business owners can, can look at is buying a car. Right. So if you are able to use a car primarily for business purposes, like, for example, you just you're having a car and you're traveling the world to interview guests, you know, podcast guests. Right. Or you're, you're filming a lot of work. You do a travel blog. Right. You're just going around the world mm-hmm. traveling. So you're using the, the vehicle primary for that. If you're able to prove those things that it's a business vehicle, you can buy a, a, a vehicle in the name of your business and take a pretty high deduction. There's what, what they call Section 179 out there. And that basically allows you to accelerate your depreciation of a capital equipment. And one of them is a car. 
and it depends on the weight of the car. So actually, the, the heavier of a car you buy, the more of a deduction you have. So if you buy like a like a mid-size SUV or like a truck, mm -hmm. you get more than if you just buy a sedan for your business. Because that's that was the purpose of it. People who are very capital intensive, giving back to the the economy and things like that. So that's also very powerful. But one one added part of the Jobs Act that added to it that made it even more enticing is you don't have to pay cash for that car. You can okay. finance that car, put zero dollars down, still get a deduction. The Interesting. Year so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different vehicles. It's really just dependent on the content creators and short term or long term needs and how they can match that. Some business owner says, what I want to do is sell my business in the next three to five years. I want to go to someone that want to buy my business, will be an aggregator and I want to buy up all, everything I have in it. Then that's like, yeah, that's fine. Then what we actually need to do is make sure that we are presenting the best investor financials for you so that when any kind of investor comes in, they're seeing a really healthy, well-run business that's going to work in the future, right? That's when you need forecasting, right? That you're like, how, how, how far along in the business? What are, your, are the other developments and things that are, that are in place so that we can show the best picture so you can get best multiple for your business? So there's, yeah. there's a lot of different paths you can take depending on what your end goals are. Let's say they made some money in content creation and they're starting an agency. You mentioned having multiple LLCs. How does that work? Do you really get liability there if you have a parent sub LLC? If people want to use it for investing into like property or like real estate, and let's say it doesn't have anything to do with the business. Yeah, that's a great question. So it, that's a two parter, right? So the first part is more on the structuring of your company. So there, the, the business structuring comes in many forms, many complexities, shades. So I don't want anyone to you know, take this part as the only way to do it. So w one simple way of structuring a business is through a parent sub company. And the main purpose is nothing else but just to give you that extra layer of liability protection, meaning that if any creditors come after your business, they can't take it all. They can only take a portion of your business, the rest is protected. When that is your central focus and, and purpose in mind, just like how you don't want to commingle your personal and business side of things, you don't want to commingle your different businesses together. Because what that happens is, again, a judge will come in and say, actually, all your business is one business. You're pretending it's all separate, but look at you. You're, you're using all your expenses from this business and putting it over here. You're borrowing money from this business and, and putting it in this business. They see that and they immediately say that this, this stuff doesn't count as separate businesses. It's all actually one combined business. And you don't want that to happen. If your goal is to not have uh, like centralized liability for all your businesses, you want to make sure that each one's able to stay on their own, have their own good operating agreement in place, have a good structure in place, have their own separate bank account in place, have separate people running them, right? Another thing is if you hire a lot of people, you want to make sure that they don't actually work for each one of your businesses, right? They want only to work for yeah. one of your business because that, that's also something that they look at. Uh, if, you, if you happen to have an office for your business, you don't want two of them to be run in the same office. That's another evident that it's actually one combined business for yourself. Got Let me give you, yeah. you the flip side of that. Flip side is, this is too much work for me, man. Like, I don't want to have open six LLCs just because I have five businesses. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. that's fine. But I want you to make sure that you understand the risk profile of each of those businesses. If one is just not super high risk, that's going to bring down all the other ones. Say you operate some yeah. kind of... I don't know, battery operated toy for your business and it has a lot of leakage issues and can burn little kids and it's very high risk you can get sued. You don't want that business to take out all your other ones, your SaaS business, your content creating business, all your other ones because everything will yeah. be affected. So that's the main reason you want the parent sub if you're running multiple business. Now the second part you're asking about real estate. So real estate you can do in two parts. One is you can use your business name to own real estate. That's perfectly fine. You actually can also spin out a separate LLC to house the real estate. Because again, it's all about liability risk. If, if for any reason your tenants that you rent out that property to decide to sue you, you want them at most be able to take away that building or that, that apartment or condo that you own and not touch anything else in your business. One thing I, I wanna caution people out there is a lot of time, I think there's some misinformation out there that people think that if they do real estate, they can take all that loss in their, their real estate business and apply it to their other forms of you know gains that they have made, like ordinary gains, which is mm -hmm. from like revenue from business. That is actually not true unless you're in a special income category or you're a real estate professional. Unless mm -hmm. you're in those two categories, what the losses from real estate is actually what they call passive loss, which means they can only be offset by passive gains and passive income. So really you can only offset you know, say you made fifty thousand dollars in rental rental from your business, and you know you incur sixty thousand dollars losses, right, in your business because the mortgage or, or it's higher than than the amount you're renting out for. Or well, that ten thousand dollars, 
only three thousand of the ten thousand dollars you can take for the current year, and the rest you actually have to roll forward for future years if you Got don't it. have those kind of losses. So yeah, there's some myth out there that you know if you have a real estate empire, you can take unlimited losses in your business. Yeah, it's not true, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you have to license to be a real estate professional. Let's say you have a five, six person company, you buy uh, a house, and then your employees work out of there, or you record podcast episodes or something like that out of the house. Are there like tax benefits there that you could uh, potentially tap into? So there's that initial tax benefit, which is what I think you alluded to, which is when you have a lot of this cash money on hand, what do you do with it? You can invest that money into the real estate. And in, in, in that case, you are kind of using the money up as a reinvestment. So then you're not gonna get taxed on that money that you're putting down on that mm -hmm. house or down payment. That part is true. What I was talking yeah. about in the previous conversation was once you get that building secure and you're renting it out to tenants and you're, you get income from the business, right? That's rental income. And then you also incur losses or like you have to do repair maintenance on the business or you decide to hire a guy out to run, like a property manager to run the business and you incur a lot of losses. That kind of losses is not going to be able to save the rest of the gains yeah, yeah. in your business, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, but it is a great way to still use up some of the cash that you have yeah. like hoard up in your business to put in real estate. There's also other things you can do with it, like this like like kind of exchange, right? Which means that once you decide to sell the, the real estate, you don't actually have to sell it for cash you can exchange it for another building or another property that you're interested in. So in a okay. way, you no cash ever change hand, you're just changing properties for a more favorable one possibly if you make a good trade. Almost like monopoly yeah. if you think about it. Is there anything that most people are like missing when they're hiring overseas in terms of like regulations? Yeah, in the, I mean, the current tax environment and you know, there's differing opinions here, but mostly people agree that hiring international contractor is just more beneficial as far as you know, compliance side goes. The reason okay. is, you know, if you hire a U.S. contractor to be rating, that's perfectly fine too. You just have to issue them a, a 1099 at the end of the day and state how much you paid them. And then that's just an additional filing you have to do, which is not a big deal. But the other thing is, you know, there's also an analysis you have to do that you want to make sure that the person you hire is actually an independent contractor and not actually classify as a W-2 employee. So if you remember the whole like news breaking about Uber and people yeah. that they have used yeah. as drivers, there was that big debate about, yeah, can Uber control the schedule, control the hours of how these guys operate? Because if you can control the schedule of the person that you're contracting, it's actually, they actually classify that, meaning that you're an employee because you're, you're, you're dictating the time and schedule and when they can work. Independent contractors, you actually can't do that. They work on their own time, on their own, own schedule. The helpful part is if you go international, it doesn't fall under these regulations. Meaning that you don't issue them a 1099, first of all, because they're international, they're not US, mm -hmm. they're not US person. So that, that's helpful, meaning that there's probably less stringent things about dictating schedule and all that stuff, because in the eye of the IRS, they should follow the same laws and regulation as a US contractor, right? And this is, of course, not, not even withstanding the, the fact that it's just probably more labor you know, savings to hire an international contractor in, the, in these days and ages still, sure. which is yeah. why a lot of companies big and small really leverage that kind of arbitrage right now in the labor market, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is uh, the labor market international are catching up. So it, yeah, it, it is the way to go for the time being is I would say that you would want to probably gear your company to hire more international contractors as long as you can hire the right people, you know, the right talent yeah. and uh, yeah, and, and keep them long-term. There are like, I know there are for certain countries, there's certain local laws that you as a, com a US company should follow, right, and, and dump them, but that's, that's another whole topic for HR.